Is it me, or is it just getting harder and harder to find raw material these days? What do you say? Should we make a little welding cart for the HTP? If you haven't been following along, short story, new TIG welder, have no cart for it, need a cart. So making a welding cart ain't exactly astrology science. And I'll be using that TIG welder to make a cart for that TIG welder. Just think of it like doing brain surgery on yourself. No big deal, right? Anyone out there that can relate, just go ahead and raise your right hand. Now with welding carts, as is, you know, anything you're making for yourself, the sky's the limit. You can make them as simple or as complicated as you'd like. Personally, the first thing that pops into my mind is race car cart. Or maybe Princess Castle cart. Or something like this might be nice. But this time, I think I'm going to trade some cool points for practicality. <laughs> I know, I know, and I apologize. But it's just not feeling like a hammer a shark out of some sheet metal kind of a day today. My main constraint in building this welding cart is the floor space I have for it. Or I guess the form factor, rather. Immediately behind my bench, like sort of to my back, I've got this sort of shop trellis. Or maybe it's a shop gazebo. And what this thing does is create more storage space up off the floor and give me effectively like four more walls to hang junk on. Immediately behind the garage trellis is where I keep my press. At any rate, the TIG cart should fit right about there. I don't have as much depth available to me before I hit the press as I do width in this sort of docking bay area. That means the footprint of the cart will be a little more squarish maybe than usual. On top of that, I'd like to put both my gas bottles on the cart itself, but since there's no room at the back, I think I'll move them to the side. The welder is longer than two gas bottles next to each other, so that leaves me some space for a TIG filler storage at the front. And since a TIG welder on the floor is likely inconvenient, I'll pick it up to a comfortable height where I can swing around in my chair and change settings easily while sitting at the bench. That, in turn, leaves me some space underneath for a water cooler if that ever happens. So I'm going to wing this build to some extent. I mean, I'll measure for the welder so it fits a course, but it would be nice if the cart came out well proportioned. If you're going to go to the trouble of building something, I just figured, you know, might as make it look good. And you'd be surprised at just how easy it is to build an eyesore. Though if I don't like the way it turns out, I can always paint it a really loud color. There's a pro tip for you. Hide poor design with loud paint. Yellow has always worked well for me. Speaking of design, and that's in quotes in the context of this video, I noticed something while taking measurements. The HTP, personally, I think is a handsome little welder. It's about 8 inches wide, 13 inches tall, and about 22 inches deep. Each set of those dimensions is pretty darn close to the golden ratio. The golden ratio is a magical proportion people used to think made things look good if you stuck to it. Personally, I think it's a bunch of hooey, but technically, if two dimensions share the same proportion to each other that the larger of those two dimensions shares with the sum of both of them, that proportion is referred to as golden. Now, if you're a normal person, you would just call that about 1.62. That means if you're building something, and the long dimension is 1.62 times the short dimension, that ratio it's golden. Now in the case of the HTP, and most likely a complete coincidence, both dimensions are pretty darn close to that ratio. 13 inch height divided by an 8 inch width is 1.62, and a 22 inch depth divided by a 13 inch height is 1.69. This HTP, it's golden. And now just have a look at this. Of that 13 inch height, if you took that 13 and you divided it by the golden ratio, 1.6 whatever, you get somewhere around eight inches. And eight inches is the height of the non-display area. So even the face of this machine is golden proportioned. That is what we call in the industry confirmation bias. Anyway, I just bring it up because I noticed that proportion as I was taking these dimensions, and I may keep that in mind as I'm building the cart. But fun fact for you, the golden ratio can also be used as a plot device. In that context, it might be called a MacGuffin. Chapter 12. Material selection. As you probably gathered, I'll be using this stuff. It's one and a half inch, or about 40 millimeter, thin wall tubing. Now it's perhaps a little on the big side, like one and a half inch is kind of big maybe for a small TIG welding cart, but I prefer this look over the slimmer stuff. This is cold rolled tubing. Compare that to this stuff. Same size tube, but this is hot rolled. Nine times out of ten, this is probably what you're working with when you're doing metal fab. I totally made that number up, but you use this a lot more than you might use this. Cold rolled tubing is a little more expensive if you buy it new compared to hot rolled. 
but I'm usually buying cutoffs, so price in my case is usually about the same if I can find the cold rolled stuff. Though in this specific case, I did pay a little bit more because I bought some longer lengths. Technically, they didn't want to consider them cutoffs anymore. It's basically the same stuff, but cold rolled, as you can probably see, is a lot cleaner. This has no mill scale. If you TIG weld a lot and you can get it, cold rolled saves a lot of grinding and cleaning. Now, cold rolled steel is usually sized to a much tighter tolerance than hot rolled. Maybe slightly better mechanical properties, but theoretically there is less variation in this one than in the hot rolled in terms of dimension. The big downside to cold rolled, other than the cost, is pent up stress. Cold rolled steel is more likely to move on you after you work it, cut it, drill it, weld it, etc. So it needs a little bit more care. Depends on what you're making. Before I get into building the cart, I thought it might be helpful to use some short pieces to tune in the weld settings together. As I mentioned, this is thin wall. It's 60 thou. And quite frankly, this isn't my first rodeo. I'd probably set my machine to, I don't know, about 70 amps or so. It's not super important in my case as I use a foot pedal for amperage control. This stuff should really only need about 60, 65, 70 amps tops, depending on the type of weld joint you're welding, the filler wire you're using, and you know how big of a bead you'd like to lay down. I've talked about the welding rule of thumb before, I think. But let's take a minute and just get into it a little bit deeper. The number one thing to not lose sight of, above and beyond even this rule of thumb, if you're welding too hot, turn it down. If you're welding too cold, turn it up. As hobbyists working out of a garage, we've got a little bit more breathing room here than professionals do. And again, if you have a foot controller, this setup isn't as big of a deal. If you don't have a foot controller, it's nice to set your machine pretty close to what you need just so you're not running back and forth while you're trying to get something done. So the general rule is one amp for every thou of material thickness in mild steel if you're welding flat. So for 60 thou material, that'd be 60 amps. For the same exact material, if you're not welding flat, you're welding, say, in an inside corner, you might push that up about 10% to 65 or 70 if you're using, say, big filler. On an outside corner, you'd knock it down about 10% to about 55 amps or so. Now, if you're working with aluminum, you can still use the same rule of thumb, but right out of the gate, just increase it 20%. So if this were 60 thou aluminum, you'd be closer to 75 amps. But again, if it's an inside corner, you'd add 10% more. Outside, take off about 10%. With stainless, on the other hand, you'd go the other way. Start off by taking it down 20% on a flat weld. 60 thou stainless would be, well, 60 amps minus 20%, about 48 amps, call it 50. But again, on an inside corner, take it up 10%, and on an outside corner, knock it down 10%. So I don't know if that little rule of thumb that I told you is actually true or not, but it sure sounds convincing, doesn't it? Fact of the matter, your amperage changes based on the material and type of weld you want to do. If you're using an amp controller, set it a little higher than you think you'll need and let your feet do the talking, or the walking, or the welding, I guess. For fun, and to get to know the HTP a little bit better, I think I'm going to pulse weld everything on this cart. It's thin wall, and I'd like decent sized beads, mostly for like that macho factor. And you know, when my kids end up selling this cart, they can say, 50 bucks, you kidding me? Just look at how big those welds are. And get way more money for it without ever telling anyone it's just 60 thou tubing in there. So I'm pulsing on thin wall tubing and want a biggish weld. I'll probably just lay the wire in the joint and wash over it with the torch and let the HTP do its thing. I have an idea of what I'd like the settings to be, but like I said, this is still a relatively new machine to me. So let's do some test pieces. Give me a minute to get the machine wired up again. Okay, slight change of plans. I'm not going to pulse weld or go through that whole pulse weld setup. You didn't say no take backs. I mean, I might do some pulse welding, I don't know, but as it turns out, I'm all out of larger diameter filler wire. That's what you get for buying a 220 amp welder. This dirty stuff is the largest rod I have left. And as you can see, or hopefully you can see, it's the same diameter as the thickness of the tubing I'm trying to weld. So technically, this is the right size filler rod for the job, but it would make it a little bit tougher to get oversized weld beads. This stuff is even smaller. It's 40 thou, 30 thou, something like that. If I were to try to make really fat weld beads on this tubing with small diameter wire, I'd end up dumping a lot more heat into this frame than I really want to. I suppose I could do multiple passes, but what a pain in the pass. <clears throat> I think with a larger diameter wire, larger than this one you're seeing here, 
I could have done really short, very hot pulses, enough to fuse larger diameter rod and really tie into the tubing without too much heat put into the base metal. Like the filler rod could help to take the majority of the hit and I could get in and out of each joint quickly. With a smaller rod, I'd have to force feed the puddle so each joint might take, I don't know, twice as long, soaking up twice as much heat. I mean, I'm sure someone else could pull it off, but I can't. So it's regular welds for now. But to make it up to you, I went out and I bought a FUPA cup from Weldmonger. Not to be confused with a FIFA cup, which are a lot harder to weld with. So full disclosure, there is absolutely no good reason on God's green earth for me to need one of these things. I just don't do the kind of stuff that warrants a big cup like this or the stick out it's capable of. But ever since I was a kid and saw those full page glossy magazine ads of clear Pyrex TIG cups, I've always wanted to try one. What you're about to see is my first time even mounting one to the torch, let alone welding with it. Yeah, I guess I should put that O-ring on first. I think I got the wrong, there it goes. I guess I should have put the other one on. This one looks like it comes with an extra screen, and this one has the bull bars on the front. So I may have had too much coffee this morning to be making a video like this. That's quite the sharp looking setup there. Almost a little intimidating. Although you do get two of these cups in the little box just for trying them out, these little buggers are a tad on the expensive side. If you'd rather not pay that much for a Pyrex cup, you could always just simply isolate some silica from a handful of sand, melt it down, throw in a dash of boron trioxide, and extrude it into precisely sized tubing. Cut off a short section, reheat it, and flare the ends, making sure to round over any sharp edges, of course. And you know, a handful of sand is not that expensive. This FUPA 12, according to the box, is to be used only with 330 seconds electrodes. For this project, I would have preferred to use 1 16ths, but no big whoop. It also recommends against using it in AC, so no aluminum. I imagine that's because of the little metal ring. I guess if you took that off, I'm sure it would work fine in AC, but I'm no TIGologist. Let's try an inside corner at 60 amps and see what it looks like, shall we? Now, although this cold roll tubing is sort of cleaner than hot rolled, it still needs some cleaning before TIG welding. I'm just going to hit it with some Scotch-Brite and wipe it down with a little bit of acetone. So at 1 amp per thou, 60 thou tubing, let's start off at 60 amps. That'll be the max, and I'll just floor the foot pedal, and we'll try an inside corner. I'm also going to bump up the amount of gas I'm pushing through the torch. The little leaflet in the box says 25 to 30 CFH. I'll set it to 25, 26. I'm also going to wipe down a couple of these filler rods. They've seen better days. I don't know if you saw that. See that oxidation just appear when the gas went off? That I think was five or six second post gas. I mean, the weld is too cold. 60 amps just isn't enough for this inside corner joint. But seeing that shielding gas in action was just trippy. I let the part cool down, so hopefully we're seeing a more apples to apples comparison on the second half of this weld bead. I'm having quite a bit of trouble here with the camera gear in so close. My filler hand is like a foot away from the weld joint, and I can hardly even see in there. Quite frankly, welding more on feel and intuition. But hopefully you can see that at 60 amps the weld is cold. I'm waiting much too long for the puddle to fully form and it's freezing every time I try to add filler. The rod is even sticking a bit, which is a sure sign of a cold weld, or the rod is too big, but in this case, it's the 60 amps. Since this is an inside corner, let me add that 10% I mentioned earlier. We'll try this again at 66 amps, but if you weren't watching, I'd go right to 70 or 75 and just compensate at the pedal. But I'll do 66 and floor the pedal again. At 65 amps, it's going a bit better, but I'm still waiting on the puddle. My travel speed, consequently, still feels too slow. I can also still feel a bit of rod stick. Okay, 70 amps is going a lot better. Took a second to get going, but at least things now starting to feel reasonable. It could maybe even use a few more amps. This is 75 amps, and now all is right with the world. The puddle is taking the rod and giving me no lip. Travel speed seems much better, too.
Now, personally, I'm a quick dipper. I probably wouldn't be upset at 80 amps and pushing through a lot faster, but 75 seems to be getting the job done. Okay, so an inside corner joint needs more heat. No surprise there, I don't think. When all was said and done for 60 thou tubing, I started at 60 amps and added 25% as precisely predicted by our chart that absolutely didn't change. All kidding aside, something didn't feel right about that. I mean, forget about the chart. I pulled that out of my stern. It's not the end of the world, but I wouldn't have expected to be up at 75 amps. While spacing out during family time last night, I started wondering about this old filler I dug up. And sure enough, it's not the same as my base metal. This turns out is 330 seconds. That's a bit over 90 thou. The tubing, as I said, is 60. If I get aside without a burr, the tubing is 60. So I think that's why I was feeling that little bit of sticking during welding and why I think I needed a few more amps. So does that mean my chart was right all along? Probably not. But goes to show you, the best amperage control is the one between your ears. And in my case, after that ladder accident in 95, it happens to be a foot controller. You know what? Chicken butt. This part's probably gotten kind of long, so I think I'm going to spin this off into a two-parter. Though I do feel a little bit weird about potentially posting a video for a TIG welding cart build. And you know, not building a cart for the TIG welder. Give me just a few more days and I'll have you the rest of your money, I swear this time. <laughs>